In the last chapter, we talked about proteins. One of the largest classes of proteins are enzymes, which are required for most of the chemical reactions in our body. In this chapter, we're going to be focusing on how biological chemical reactions occur and how enzymes catalyze these reactions. So in this introductory video, we'll specifically talk about types of energy and how the laws of thermodynamics apply to that energy, how that leads to the concept of free energy, and we'll learn about endergonic and exergonic reactions. Actions. By the end of this video, you should be able to describe and recognize different forms of energy as well as differentiate between endergonic and exergonic reactions. So first, let's talk about energy. So all life requires energy, which can be defined as the capacity to do work. This includes heat, chemical energy, electrical energy, mechanical energy, as well as radiant energy. And here in this picture, we see two types of energy. Kinetic energy, which is the energy of motion, as well as potential energy, which is stored energy. So here you can see that this diver is standing on top of the diving board. So he has a lot of potential energy. However, when this diver jumps off of the diving board, he's converted that potential energy into kinetic energy, the energy of motion. Then, when divers begin climbing up the ladder, that restores their kinetic, excuse me, restores their potential energy. So now, I told you that the focus of this chapter is going to be enzymes. So first, what is an enzyme? An enzyme is a protein that catalyzes a biochemical reaction. And by catalyze, I mean increases the rate of that reaction. Enzymes are required for metabolism, which is the biochemical use and modification of organic molecules to support all of the activities of life. And there are two major types of reactions that comprise metabolism. First, we have catabolic reactions that break down complex molecules to release energy. And second, we have anabolic reactions that require energy and use it to build molecules. Now, catabolic reactions, you can think of the reactions that digest your food to release the energy from your food. Whereas anabolic reactions are reactions that build the building blocks of life, such as here, you see an advertisement for anabolic enzymes that would help a bodybuilder to build muscles. Now the laws of thermodynamics govern this flow of energy in living systems, and all energy, all living systems, excuse me, the flow of energy in all living systems occurs according to these laws. So the first law of thermodynamics says that energy cannot be created or destroyed. This is often referred to as the principle of conservation of energy. And basically this means that the total amount of energy in a system and its surroundings is constant. The second law says that when a system and its surroundings change a state, that the entropy of the system increases. So this is often summarized as everything tends toward disorder. Now this may seem strange that everything is moving towards disorder or entropy. However, if you think about it, sometimes even ordered processes lead to disorder of the universe. For example, even though making an organism may seem like a very ordered process, that organism frequently increases the entropy or disorder of the system. So for example, we as humans release waste, we generate heat, so all of these factors increase the entropy of the system. So our next question is, how are these laws of thermodynamics applied? First, and most importantly, the laws of thermodynamics can be applied to determine whether a reaction is energetically favorable. Now it's important to note that these laws do not determine the rate of the reaction. They don't determine how fast the reaction occurs, only whether it is energetically favorable for that reaction to happen spontaneously. So based on the laws of thermodynamics, we can derive this equation. Delta G equals delta H minus T delta S. 
Now let's see how that, what that means. So first, delta means change. So delta G is the change in free energy. So free energy is the energy in a system that's available to do work. But most importantly for our purposes, if delta G is a negative value, then that reaction is energetically favorable. Next we have delta H. So once again, delta means change, but here H refers to enthalpy. For our purposes, enthalpy can be defined as the bond energy of the system. So what I mean is all of the energy contained in the bonds that are reacting. So delta G equals delta H minus T delta S. Here T refers to the temperature specifically in units of Kelvin. And delta S refers to the change in entropy. As you remember, entropy refers to the total disorder of the system. Now, this is not the only way that we can calculate delta G. We can also calculate delta G because delta G for a reaction is equal to the free energy of the products minus the free energy of the reactants. So there are two types of reactions that can be derived by looking at delta G in this way, an exergonic reaction and an endergonic reaction. So first, let's look at the exergonic reaction. In an exergonic reaction, the free energy of the reactants is higher than that of the products. So you can think of as we move through this reaction, we're going down hill in energy. So this means that the free energy decreases from the reactants to the products. And in this case, delta G would be negative because the free energy of the products is less than that of the reactants. And as we stated in the previous slide, if delta G is negative, the reaction is energetically favorable and it will occur spontaneously. And in addition, exergonic reactions release energy. Now an endergonic reaction is just the opposite. In an endergonic reaction, the free energy of the reactants is less than that of the product. So in this case, we can think of the reaction as moving uphill. So the free energy increases, and because the free energy of the products is greater than the free energy of the reactants, delta G is positive. So because delta G is positive, in this case, the reaction is energetically unfavorable, it will not occur spontaneously, and for that reaction to occur requires an input of energy. So as a part of this video, you should be able to differentiate between exergonic reactions and endergonic reactions, and now you know two different ways to calculate the change in free energy, delta G, of a reaction. And that's the end of this video.